Hi, I'm Zor. Welcome to Inizor Education. Um, today we will talk about new type of energy, the energy of gravitational field. So right now we are talking about gravitational field uh, as, as a concept. Now this lecture is part of the course called Physics for Teens, uh, offered on Unizor.com. If you, if you found this lecture somewhere else, like on YouTube, just stand alone, um, you, you just have to understand that this is le a lecture which is part of the course. There are prerequisites, there are, you know, prior lectures. Uh, by the way, one of the prerequisites of this course is another course, which is called Math for Teens, um, which I consider to be uh, necessary to understand the physics, because uh, especially calculus and vector algebra, um, because I'm always using these concepts uh, in, in physics. Um, well, actually, I can say that the whole calculus as a, uh, a, a, as a part of the mathematics um, was invented uh, f because of the certain things in physics which, which people like Newton uh, had to understand and describe, etc. So, math is very important. Okay, okay. Um, so we are talking about gravitational fields right now. Um, before, before we were talking about different forces which are acting um, uh, on a very short distance, like for instance uh, the horse pulls the wagon, so there is a connection between them, they're touching each other. So these are forces which we are talking um, about uh, acting on a very short distance and there is a definite material connection between the source of the force and the object it acts upon. So it's like pushing or pulling or whatever. Now, gravitational uh, forces are uh, felt uh, or are acting upon the distance. So, for instance, the comet is flying somewhere near the sun and it changes its orbit because the sun pulls it. There is no physical connection, no material connection between them. So, the gravitational force is is interesting e e exactly, but because of this absence of any material connection between the source and the object um, participating in in the action. So that's very important quality, and physicists for a very long time did not really understand how to approach this until they just came up with this concept which is called field um, which is well the field is uh, the part of the space the area of the space uh, where certain forces are felt by certain objects um, something like gravitational force is felt by any object. So, any object which is moving in the gravitational field will change its direction because of gravitational force. Now, there are some other uh, uh, fields, like electromagnetic fields, and they're acting on, only on certain objects um, which have these electromagnetic properties. doesn't act uh, on a stone, for instance. So, Let's talk about the definition. Again, we are talking about gravitational force as something which is um, basically an area of space where uh, the gravitational field is an area of space where gravitational force acts on a distance without any kind of a physical contact between the source and the object. Um, sometimes I will use the word probe instead of the object. So there is a source of gravitational field, like for instance our planet Earth or Sun. And there is a probe, some kind of an object which is positioned somewhere um, near this particular source of gravitational field and it feels this force, the gravitational field, and its direction of movement depends on, uh, on, on this force or its changes because of this force. So, um, now let's talk about numerical um, representation of this force. 
now we were talking about gravitational force when uh, this, uh, when we were talking about dynamics in, in, in the mechanics um, so we actually explained uh, what happens and uh, the force was expressed as Um, proportional to masses of the source and the probe object. It's inversely proportional to square distance between them. And this is the universal gravitational constant. Now, let me explain a little bit this formula. Um, we, we did talk about this before, but I just want to repeat it. These masses are gravitational masses. So, it's a measure of how gravitational force acts upon this particular object. Now, before, in mechanics, we were talking about uh, inertial masses. Remember this second law uh, of Newton? Now, this is inertial mass. Now, Experimentally, it was discovered that they are actually proportional to each other. And that's why we are using one concept, mass, which is used in both inertial and gravitational meaning. Now, in this particular case, that was historically the first, so the unit of mass, uh, the unit of acceleration, and the unit of force were established in such a way that you can have this equation without any kind of coefficients. Now, since this is done, our mass is already established. It's grams, kilograms, whatever else. So we're using the same units to measure the gravitational mass, and that's why the formula actually doesn't look as pretty as this one. We need this coefficient to align um, the units of uh, measurement. So this is the same newtons, for instance, as in this case, and this is the same kilograms as, as this one, and this is the same meters and time is in seconds as here, as meters and time in seconds. So that's why we need this coefficient to basically equalize. But what's important is that the mass uh, participating in uh, gravitational uh, activity uh, is proportional to the mass participating in uh, activity related to plane uh, dynamics. So, that's about masses. Now let's talk about square of the distance between, um, between these masses. Well, first of all, I assume that masses are point masses. So it's easier than to talk about the distance between them because it's the distance between two points. Now, why is it square? Well, I, I think I uh, already offered this explanation. It's not a proof, it's an explanation, basically, um, that if you have a source of um, gravity, then the force actually is spread around the whole sphere around it, right? And it's the same force which is spread around bigger circle, a big, bigger sphere, right? So, the same mass positioned here and there. Well, since the same force is spread around a bigger surface, then to a particular point or, or, or a, a small square which is positioned here, the amount of these forces uh, are inversely proportional to the area and area of um, of the sphere is as we know 4 pi r square so that's why the greater the radius uh, the greater the surface in square with proportional to r uh, to radius square so the same force is basically distributed on a bigger uh, surface and that's why it's inversely proportional to this one and again everything which is related to dimensions um, 
to, to, to bring them to bring them into numerically equivalent um, values are hidden in this constant. Okay, so this is the force which acts upon a point object on a distance r uh, of mass m from the source of the gravity m. Well, to tell you exactly, obviously this object acts upon the source as well. I mean, it's mutually attracted. Uh, but in our case, when we are imagining the source of gravity being, let's say, Sun or Earth, and this probe object being probably something small, we can probably say that, okay, whatever the force is act, acted upon this particular object is the force which has a source as a, as, a, as a Earth or a Sun, and we basically ignore how this object attracts the Sun. Okay, now, how um, from this particular expression of the force um, I can go into some characteristic of the um, gravitational field which basically characterizes the field. Now there is a very convenient method using which we can characterize the strengths of the field. And, uh, and here it is. Let's just think about uh, the field from the energy standpoint. Well, if you have an object which is the source of uh, gravitational field, and a probe object. Let's say this is fixed at zero, zero coordinates. Now this one has certain coordinate x. Well, then the object will be attracted and the force directed towards um, the origin of uh, coordinates, right? Okay, fine. Now, what I would like to do is, I would like to measure how much work um, the field will do to basically move this particular object from one location to another. Well, let's consider the location is R1, this location is R2, so we are moving from R1 to R2. So, all the time, the field acts upon this particular object, right? And this, the, the, the strength of the field is this one, right? So, the function which describes the force as the function of uh, distance from the origin um, of coordinates is this. Right? So direction of the force is against the x coordinates. Now, what should I do to find out amount of work which field does by moving from here to here? Well, the force is variable, right? It depends. So I can't really simply multiply force by the distance because the force is uh, is changing. However, I can break it into infinitely small um, segments. Each of them has the, um, the size dx, differential of x. Now, on this distance, my force is this one. So, I have to basically integrate force times dx from R1 to R2 to summarize all these little um, infinite, infinitesimally small um, segments because this represents the amount of work the field does uh, when we are moving from x to x plus dx, right? Okay, fine, so let's just do it. Let's calculate this integral. 
it will be this. First of all, I'll put minus here because the force acts against the positive direction of the x because this is actually supposed to be a scalar product of two vectors but vector dx is always this way vector f at x always this way so that's why I can just simply put the minus sign and put dx here put integral from r1 to r2 and this is a very easy integral by the way because as we know the derivative of 1 over x is minus 1 over x squared, right? So knowing that, you can very easily integrate this sink and it will be a g m m over x from r1 to r2 which is equal to g m m 1 over r2 minus 1 over r1 so that's the value of this integral and this is amount of work which field does to move from position r1 to position r2 now here I will do something which I rarely do I'll state something without the proof um, you see we are talking about a spherical uh, field right so if you have let's just consider we are in space right this is the source of the um, gravity and we can move any way in the gravitational field all right now the statement which I would like to make is the following amount of work which is needed to move from this point to this point depends only on difference basically it, it, it depends only on, on distances the beginning in the distance and the ending distance and here is why now I talked about this as amount of energy field spans well if we are talking about outside uh, forces its amount of and I would like to know how much outside forces have to spend energy to move from one uh, point to another now in this case field actually helps us right from R1 we are going closer to R2 field pulls this particular object into this direction it's not outside forces which do the job it's the field helps us to do the job which means that if we are talking from the position of outside of this system then the work which is needed should actually be well this value but with a minus sign so whenever we are moving our object closer we are making we, we are um, uh, we, are, we are working basically gaining energy not spending this whenever we are pulling from uh, the source of gravity further then we are spending energy so that's why whenever we are moving to a very complicated trajectory so whenever we are moving a little bit closer we are gaining energy because the field actually helps us whenever we are trying to move away we spend this energy and eventually all I'm saying is that pluses and, and minuses are negating each other I mean it's obvious in the one-dimensional case right if you're moving if you're moving this way there then it's negative energy if you're moving this way it's it's positive energy which we have to spend right but eventually if we go back to the same place it will be zero right because nothing's changed and uh, so in one dimensional case it's, it's obvious in three dimensional case it's not obvious but mathematically it's very easy to show basically all I'm saying and I don't want to overload with this three dimensional uh, variations of uh, this particular uh, problem I'm explaining on one dimensional case and just asking you to believe me that in a three dimensional case it's exactly the same 
So, amount of work which outside forces must spend uh, depend, depends only on the distance, the beginning distance and the ending distance, and this amount of work is equal to this with a minus sign. So, the, whenever it's a plus sign, we have just calculated it's the field which is doing. If we are looking at this from the outside, outside should, should have it with a minus sign. Okay, that's fine. Now we will introduce a very useful function which does not depend on the probe object. It's a function which describes the field only. You see, what actually here is dependent on the object, the mass. Right? So let's introduce the function which is equal to g m divided by r with a minus sign. Now, if r1 is infinity, then we will have basically this, right? Without m. So, if we will take a unit an object of a unit mass and move it from infinity towards location on a distance r from the source of gravity, that's amount of work which we have to do. And again, it's negative because it's actually the field which helps us, it's not v. However, if we want to move from r to infinity, it will be exactly the same but with a plus sign, obviously, right? So this is called gravitational potential. It's a characteristic of the field. This particular, in this particular case, we are talking about a spherical gravitational field, which is produced by a point object of mass capital M. So on any distance r from the position, from the center of gravity, from the position of this fixed source of um, gravitational field, this is a potential. And whenever we want to know uh, amount of energy needed to move an object from one place to another, well, this amount of energy is equal to multiplied by mass. So it's a difference between potentials and this is the potential function times mass. So potential, gravitational potential, is a characteristic of the field. At any point within the gravitational field around this particular um, point object of mass m, this is a characteristic of the field, the strength of the field, you s uh, whatever you want to call it. So it's, it's called gravitational potential. And again, from this we can always find the amount of energy needed to move from one position within the gravitational field to another by the probe object with mass m. Alright, what else did I not talk about. Let me check. Okay. Right. So, basically, I would like to emphasize one more. Gravitational potential is a very important characteristic of the gravitational field. Now, in this particular field, we are talking about the spherical field. Now, um, there might be more complicated field. Consider the solar system. We have the planets, and the planets also have their own gravitational field. And gravitational field of the Sun is one thing, and gravitational field of the uh, Earth or, or Jupiter or something else is another. They're all interpositioned somewhere, somehow. So we can't really use this centrally symmetrical, spherically symmetrical model, but what we can do is at any given moment of time, the gravitational field somewhere in the solar system has its potential. Because it's, it's a sum of all the different um, gravitational fields, 
and the potential describes the field and all we need to know to find the amount of work to move from one position in the solar system to another is to know potential here and potential there. And then multiplying their difference by m, we know amount of energy which is needed, regardless of the trajectory. Well, this is obviously an ideal situation. Obviously, again, there are some losses of energy, etc., etc. But in any case, in ideal case, in a purely theoretical sense, the potential, the gravitational potential function, regardless of how it's expressed right now, for instance, it's, it's a complicated in case we have more than one mass, right? But whatever, whatever we have discovered as a function, we can use it to calculate the amount of energy. Now, what else is important here is the following. Now, if this is um, the potential, let's Let's do this. Let's take the first derivative of this. This is 1 over r with a minus sign. The derivative 1 over r square, right? Minus and minus. So we will have exactly what we have here multiplied by m. So what I want to say is that knowing potential uh, knowing gravitational potential, not only we can find out very easily amount of work needed to move an object from one point to another, we also know the force which is acting at this particular point R. And here I would like actually to mention one thing. Force is a vector. Potential is a constant it's a scalar. Now, in a one-dimensional case, it's kind of easy because what is the derivative? Derivative is value of one point minus value of another point divided by the distance between these points, right? In a three-dimensional, it's a three-dimensional um, vector because, again, what we do is we have one point in three-dimensional and another point. The distance is a vector. So, whenever we are calculating this, it's called gradient, actually, of the uh, gravitational field. So, it's a vector which actually shows which direction the um, gravitational potential grows. So, we will talk about this maybe a little bit more details in another lecture, but I just wanted to know that we can derive from this gravitational potential we can derive energy needed to move from one place to another, and we can determine the strengths of the force and direction, the strengths and direction of the force acting um, upon the, the object. All right? Which means that this is actually like acceleration, and now we are going into a second law of Newton, right? Okay, so that's it for today. Uh, I do recommend you to read the textual material for this particular lecture. Uh, it just helps you to digest this concept of a field, gravitational potential, etc. Um, that's it. Thanks very much and goodbye.